Hello, John Monroe here, uh, introducing a new research project and an interview. I've been asked to speak uh, at an upcoming workshop in June of 2022 on the question of dispossession and the commons. And this is going to be a discussion um, about forms of property and the relationship between property and theft in a colonial context. So I've been asked to speak at this um, workshop and I'm looking very forward to doing so. I don't have so much expertise, particularly on this kind of theoretical question of, um, of property and, and theft. Um, again, in a, in a colonial context, I mean, I'm a historian of colonialism, I think, but, um, but I was thinking about how to go about this. And so, um, given that I spend a lot of my brain space thinking about car culture, I thought it actually might be a way into the topic. So, um, so the, the, my presentation at this workshop is going to be called Stealing Cars. And what I mean by this isn't uh, people stealing cars, but rather how cars as a form of individualized uh, sort of transport technology themselves steal public space uh, away from uh, the general population. And so in the amount of space that, that is public space, it's given over to uh, this one form of, of transport. Um, and so I wanted to think about that issue of cars as a technology of theft, and so cars doing the stealing, and then connecting that up to um, other, other structures of power, colonialism, uh, and other structures of power around race, class, and gender. So thinking a bit more about this, I thought, okay, so there's my idea. Now, how should I figure out how to do this? And so I thought what I'd do is I would conduct a series of interviews, a series of conversations with people and learn from them who have given more thought to this kind of set of connections um, and have been thinking about the, these kinds of connections for, for a long time. So, um, so what I'm going to do is have a series of interviews and um, in these interview conversations then I'll talk through some of these questions uh, with a variety of, of experts. Uh, I'm not sure how many interviews it'll be. We'll see. Maybe five. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, so I had the great uh, good fortune of being able to have my first of these conversations with Jogu Morgan, who's a postdoctoral scholar um, at Witzwatersrand University in South Africa. And his work first got onto my radar because he wrote this fantastic article in The Guardian about the relationship between cycling, car culture, and apartheid, uh, the history of apartheid in South Africa. And so, uh, and I'll put a link um, below the video to that article because I really recommend that people check it out. So um, I had a wonderful discussion with him about these connections. And so this is the beginning of um, a kind of series of, of conversations from which I will be gathering insights for my own presentation. But I thought also, why not post them online so that, um, so that other people can, can gain um, from, from the insights of the people that I'll, that I'll be talking to um, on this uh, new project that I'm embarking on called Stealing Cars. So here's my interview uh, with Jogu, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. OK, well, hello, everyone. My name is John Monroe, and I teach US history at the University of Birmingham. Today, um, I'm speaking with Jogu Morgan about the intersection between car culture and other structures of power as part of the research for a project I'm working on entitled Stealing Cars. Jogu undertook uh, undergraduate studies in political science and international relations uh, at Northwestern University in Chicago. And uh, he did a master's degree in public um, development management from the University um, of Witzwatersrand before completing his PhD in town and regional planning also at Wits. His doctoral research examines the changing dynamics of bicycle use in Amsterdam, Beijing, Chicago, and Johannesburg. And Jogu is also involved in present day efforts to bring about a more cyclable uh, greater Johannesburg through organizations such as the Johannesburg Urban Cyclists Association. Um, 
So uh, hi, Njogu, thanks for, for taking the time to, to talk with me today. Uh, thank you, thank you, John, uh, it's a pleasure. Great, um, and let me just double check before we get into the questions. Did the record button come on at your end? Yeah, it did. Perfect, I, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Announcement. <laughs> Excellent, okay, super. Well, um, let's get into it then. So can, we, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you become interested in cycling, cars, and urban transportation issues as an academic subject? Well, yeah, thanks, John. Uh, it was really at the intersection of my beginning to think about my kind of PhD topic uh, and the sort of other recreational advocacy work that I was doing. You mentioned the Johannesburg Urban Cyclist Association. Uh, uh, yeah, so I was at the same time as, as I was putting together my PhD proposal uh, or concept, very early concept, I was involved with some of the colleagues with that association trying to lobby the municipality to make Johannesburg uh, more cycling friendly and really struggling with that, uh, really struggling to persuade policymakers to that it's, this is a worthwhile intervention, uh, what, what could they do, uh, and feeling frustrated that um, things weren't, I guess, I think we were impatient at the time <laughs> to see transformation happen. Um, and so I think this question of change around mobility I and mean, how do things change and so on, um, that's how that kind of entered my head. And I thought, hey, maybe I could, uh, instead of beating down the doors of policymakers, maybe let's try and go and study it and try and figure out, uh, first of all, how Johannesburg became so uh, unfriendly to commuter cycling and it's a car oriented city. Um, and I was, you know, began to think about maybe there's something to be said about the kind of uh, the context itself in terms of the politics and so on. And that's why the kind of comparative aspect came in when, when I was thinking about, uh, okay, let's try and trace the history of, uh, of cycling or mobility in Johannesburg, but also let's put that in conversation with other places. Um, so that's kind of how I got into this <laughs> um, cycling in mobility as like an academic study uh, and haven't looked back since then. Wow, that's great. That's so fascinating. And I can relate and I imagine many people who might listen to this conversation could really relate to that kind of frustration of trying to make your city safer for modes of transportation that are not cars and finding that really difficult to, to, to carry on. So now that you've, you're obviously you know, quite focused on the academic study side of things, um, are you continuing in the public advocacy part of things? And, or is that a little bit on the back burner now? <laughs> That's a little bit on the back burner, uh, just because question of time. I suppose the way I think of it now is my, you know, my findings can be useful to policymakers, uh, and 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 I think since I started, which is also something I'm beginning to think about again, uh, you know, since I started doing my PhD work in Johannesburg, has gone through its own. Uh, transformations around um, the kind of focus on cycling. So I mentioned to you that we were knocking on the doors of policymakers and trying to tell them, hey, do something. Maybe you can build bicycle lanes or bicycle parking facilities going on. Uh, the, something um, that began to shift a bit. Uh, and and uh, we were fortunate at the time to have a mayor who really, for one reason or another, got this kind of agenda and starting to do things um, in the direction that we wanted to go. Uh, but since then, uh, that kind of focus has, with the change in leadership has gone away. Um, so I think my focus has, you know, has been uh, primarily currently is on academic work because uh, there's not much happening in actually on the ground, not right, to mention right. COVID. Yeah. So. Of course, that too, exactly. Well, I will say for myself that your academic work is what led me to, to find you. So the work is definitely uh, circulating, which brings me to a question. I was fascinated by your 2019 Guardian article entitled How Apartheid Killed Johannesburg's Cycling Culture. Now, cycling isn't always the first thing we think of when we think about apartheid. Can you explain the connection? Yeah, sure. And, I, and I'd be... You know, I'd be eager to hear uh, about your own reflections after reading the article, but what, you know, what in particular jumped out when you read it uh, for you. But you're right, I think usually, you know, when it's difficult to connect on face value, cycling and apartheid. Uh, 
um, in the article that you reference um, really talks about how apartheid directly and indirectly you know, stifled what I then discovered in the course of my PhD research was that um, once upon a time, I suppose like many cities worldwide, Johannesburg had a thriving commuter cycling culture. Um, and then colonialism and apartheid, it's a long story, sort of come in and, and really through, yeah, and I think the article talks about the impact of spatial segregation in creating uh, very lengthy commuter uh, distances. Uh, I think it also talks about this sh gradual shift towards car-oriented planning that becomes really hostile to, you know, pedestrians, uh, anybody else other than anything else that other than the kind of motor frame. Um, so the article is really, um, you know, I discovered in the course of my own work that actually uh, apartheid directly and indirectly um, uh, really throttled what had been a very thriving uh, commuter cycling culture. I mean, I was shocked that to discover, you know, in the 1910s and even before the municipal council would give incentives uh, to workers, for instance, to go and buy a bicycle. Uh, they would build uh, parking facilities. Uh, and, you know, you know, cycling, unlike, unlike nowadays, even if we go back to the beginning of the city in the, in the late 19th century was, you know, was, was, was you know, undertaken by people of all kind of background, you know, the elite, you know, would cycle uh, and so on. Um, so yeah, it really kind of discovered this culture. And so the apartheid connection was really about um, what happened <laughs> to, to commuter cycling. Um, but of course, I mean, there are other ways in which, I mean, I don't talk about this. Uh, I don't think the article mentioned this uh, directly, uh, um, but I, I think what I also discovered in the course of the, of the research, which is connected to the, your question around apartheid is that in this kind of era or phase that I'm telling you where there's a shift towards car oriented planning, it's also a phase in which the kind of wider social conflicts uh, around uh, race, for instance, uh, no, no, not for instance, around race and so on, um, also become manifest on streets. Um, uh, so uh, in, 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 different, in a different piece of work, I look at how um, on a road called Louis Bota Avenue, as, uh, and this happens particularly in the 1930s, um, you know, it's a time in which there is a gold, uh, gold mining boom uh, unfolding in Johannesburg. Uh, and the middle class can then suddenly, or not suddenly, are able to afford motor vehicles. It's, uh, so it's a time of uh, motorization. Um, and of course, which goes back to one of your questions, um, uh, uh, so there's a connection between race and class at this time. So the middle class that I'm telling you is of able to afford motor vehicles is a wide population. Uh, and so you have this kind of gradual trans transformation in mobility practices where um, uh, cycling increasingly becomes, uh, commuter cycling becomes a practice for the working class and predominantly the black working class, whereas car use is, uh, becomes a kind of a Again, you know, it's a, it's a white population. Uh, so there's like really intense conflict for road space that is happening on Louis Vuitton Avenue. And one of the ways in which this happens, it becomes really racialized and ugly things are said and so on. Um, so, I mean, it's really what I found, it's, it's very difficult to, to dislocate a mobility practice from its context. And, and, um, and finally, before I talk too long, <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, I think what's also became clear in thinking about um, uh, cycling and even let's just say mobility practices in this kind of long-term frame within the context of apartheid you well know very much that one of the central imperatives of apartheid was control the control of the um, uh, uh, you know people of color and I th I've really been influenced by the work of Cotton Saylor who's you know really suggested that in context of white supremacy, I think forms of independent mobility um, uh, create all kinds of anxiety. Uh, and, and I think this is what we see in apartheid South Africa around cycling. <laughs>
Wow, fascinating. So, so many things. Yeah, um, I could now talk for a long time in response to all those uh, interesting points you raised. I'll just start by saying I also have been influenced by Cotton Sailor's uh, Republic of Drivers, and I think it's a really important study for connecting racial dynamics and the kind of control and power structure that that on mobility represents. I mean, just to quickly answer your question to me about how the article resonated with me, I would say a couple of things. One is that you know, as you know better than me, there's a conversation of, there's a version of this conversation in many cities around the world right now. What are we gonna do with the public space and how are we gonna deal with the relationship between cars and other kinds of modes of transportation and access to public space? But what I find to be often missing in those general conversations, public conversations, is an analysis of race, class, gender, and colonialism in the discussion. I think, I think for many people who are thinking in contemporary ways about how we might make the city more fair in order to accommodate more modes of transportation, might think colonialism is, that's something in the past and, and doesn't really have that much bearing on this, it seems like separate conversations or something. Um, and I feel like your article did such an excellent job of, of making that connection. And then here in a place like Birmingham, you know, I feel like Birmingham's car culture could be connected, would be some thinking to do here, but in ways that the metropole is reshaped by the experience of empire as well. Um, and so there's a way we could think in a longer trajectory about how ideas of control, private property, who has access, the colonialism is all about, helps reshape the city in ways that help us to understand how car culture came about in the way that it has. But I'll also say this is that, um, being from Vancouver, Canada, um, a city founded in 1886, one of, the, one of the things that jumped out in your article was exactly how you say the story of Johannesburg begins with the discovery of gold in 1886. And I thought, ah, Canada, of course, has a obviously different, but in many ways, parallel kind of settler colonial history in terms of the ways that apartheid-like structures um, in relationship to indigenous uh, peoples and settlers um, is, 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 you know, how Canada obviously founded on indigenous territory um, and, uh, and that is absolutely central to what Canada is today as well. And there's a way that we might wanna think about the kinds of control that colonialism in a Canadian context and just that kind of uncanny like 1886 in both places, just kind of an interesting point of connection to think about simultaneity there, um, that forms of colonial control um, are, at the very least in the background, and in your work, you move it into the foreground, and that's what I just find so fascinating and so generative, um, to think about this connection between colonialism, you know, forms of property, forms of control, and cars and, and bicycles. So, so there's a lot, uh, there's a lot in, in what you're already doing that, that really resonates with me, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you. Um, because of because of all of this, so it's really nice to be to be in in conversation with you uh, about this. Okay, let me ask you another question. So one of the reasons why I wanted to speak to you, as I mentioned, is I'm just beginning to do some work on a paper that I'm calling "Stealing Cars," and what I mean by this isn't people stealing cars, but rather cars as a kind of force of privatization, which itself sort of steals private property away from the, or steals public property away from, from the, the, the kind of, um, I guess, the, from the commons or from, from, from uh, the population or, or what have you. Um, so I want to consider this idea about how privatization can be a form of theft of, of public property and the role that automobility kind of plays in that. So I'm interested in how people um, have, have thought about this. I'm starting to learn about this, and this is why I wanted to speak to, to people like you who have thought about these kinds of questions for longer and, and more deeply. I'm also interested, of course, in how people have challenged uh, the dominance of the car. So I'm curious then, big question, but do you see connections between what we sometimes call car culture and structures of power organized around race, class, colonialism, and gender, for example, in contemporary South Africa? <laughs> yeah, very big question. Uh, go where you I, like with it. Oh gosh, yeah, I was going to say, I think one can approach your question from so many different directions, depending on their, and their interests. Uh, I mean, I think when I was thinking about this question is um, just to say that I'm obviously joining a conversation that other people have been having around, especially, you know, precisely around this question of public space and automobility. Um, and I think specifically 
uh, I guess my entry point is thinking about streets or, or roads as a public space. And as I said, you know, there have been you know, quite a few scholars who've been working in this area. Peter Norton, uh, for instance, been uh, highly influenced by his work uh -huh. uh, and, and, and many other scholars. But um, I think in the Johannesburg context, uh, when you ask about the contemporary, I suppose the only the one way to think about this is, um, I think we're we are living in in the aftermath of, to use your to use your words, uh, in the aftermath of stealing, <laughs> in the aftermath of automobility having stolen uh, streets um, away from uh, diverse uses. Uh, again, you know, uh, you know. They, Thinking about this question, you know, in a long-term perspective, it's it's really really interesting uh, when we look at what the street culture was, let's say, in the late nineteenth century, um, early twentieth century. Uh, you know, streets were really like this kind of, again, to use your words, uh, public space. Um, you know, pictures of people having meetings, stopping right in the middle of the of the road, uh, kids playing uh, on the streets. Um, uh, but also uh, streets being used, you know, people walking on the streets, uh, you see animal drawn vehicles, um, you obviously the trams and so on, um, you see tractors, you see people on bicycles, um, and also the, uh, I suppose, you know, one sees a less kind of organized way of inhabiting and using streets than we, than we would see nowadays. Um, so you see, you know, men riding bicycles uh, side by side, a few women, uh, going back to your, to your gender question. Um, uh, but, but since then, um, so I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, historically, uh, in, in general, and again, you know, this is common worldwide, um, you know, streets are really this kind of public space. Um, and the story of, automo of automobility is in Johannesburg and in many other places is really a story of how that kind of mixed use, uh, uh, mixed use history of, of streets in Johannesburg uh, is really transformed gradually. Uh, and it's a transformation that goes back to your questions of power and you know, fundamentally it's one in which, um, you know, very, various actors over a very long period of time and using a variety of different strategies, really reshape and reappropriate re uh, uh, streets away. So I think what I would say is what we are living with uh, currently is, in, is, is really the aftermath of this process. And I was thinking, I mean, there's so many stories one can tell. <laughs> I was thinking of one particular one because I think it draws as an example because it brings questions of race, uh, class, and so on nicely together and to show how this kind of change happens. Um, so I focus on cycling. Uh, uh, so the story is around a bicycle law um, that comes in, uh, you know, that is promulgated, promulgated in 1937, if I remember correctly. Um, but the background of this law is that in the 1920s, um, again, it, it's, um, I think I mentioned earlier that the 1930s uh, are a period in which the middle class in Johannesburg is able to afford motor cars. But in the 1920s, cars are still kind of a luxury item beyond, uh, beyond the means of, of, let's say the middle class and, uh, and, and the working class. Um, but nevertheless, there's a growing automobile lobby. Um, so this group called the Transvaal Automobile Club which used to meet at a very fancy golf club. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, is, you know, increasingly getting, yeah, there's, there's growing, again, going back to the streets, competition for road space. Um, they want to go faster. I mean, I've, you know, I've told you that there's this kind of background in which streets are this kind of mixed use uh, spaces. You can cross the streets in any way that you want. Uh, so if increasingly you're behind a motor vehicle, you obviously want to go and go faster and, and um, you want to get the pedestrians, the cyclists out of the way and so on. Uh, so in the 1920s, they go to the municipal council and say, look, you need to ban the practice of people riding their bicycles side by side, uh, because this is obviously creating danger in traffic uh, <laughs> and it's slowing us. Uh, but at the time, 
the municipal council say is actually no, it's actually people in motor vehicles, uh, it's actually motor cars that are more dangerous, uh, present a more uh, in the streets of Johannesburg. So, um, and especially if they're driving side by side. <laughs> so they refuse uh, to do this. Um, but it's also worth saying that uh, as far as I can determine historically, uh, because I've been trying to trace the kind of changing racial composition in mobility practices, um, they still have uh, fairly sizable uh, white, at least working class population that is cycling in, in Johannesburg. Uh, there's even a, a lobby group that was uh, working in the region, uh, you know, uh, so working both in Johannesburg and in the nearby capital city then uh, of Pretoria, um, that is really continuing to lobby for the rights of uh, working class commuters. Um, so anyway, this does not, uh, their desire to ban the practice of cycling side by side, uh, it is, is, is uh, the municipality refuses to agree to this. But in, in, in the 1930s, um, they win. <laughs> Uh, the municipality says, okay, uh, we're going to ban this uh, from now on. And it also coincides with this, uh, again, change in where, as I mentioned, uh, but this time, uh, commuter cycling has become largely a black working class practice. And so this struggle that I was telling you that is unfolding on this particular street called Louis Bota is fundamentally one of, of well, one way of seeing it is, yeah, it's an intersection of race and color. Um, uh, where, again, without telling really long stories, um, the black working class commuters are heavily demonized in the white press uh, for obstructing motor vehicle traffic um, uh, and so on. So I suppose, yeah, this is one example just to show you. Uh, and as we speak, uh, the same law is on the books. Um, it is illegal for two people to ride their bicycles side by side, uh, unless you're overtaking. Um, obviously, of course, uh, I've never seen any police officers as enforcing this law, uh, but nevertheless, it's on the books. Um, and, mo and motorists know that uh, they will hoot at you if they find you, you know, cycling and by side, side by side. So yeah, uh, I think my... Yeah, to answer your question, I think we are living in the aftermath of this kind of long historical process in which cars have really reappropriated re um, what I think is a public space um, in their, for themselves. Well, Njogu, I'm so glad you shared that story because to me that um, about the, the cyclists riding side by side, because to me that so perfectly encapsulates kind of some of the work that needs to be done and the work that you're already doing on this. And what I mean is, you know, as you know well, there's a conversation about this in many contexts, um, about the cyclists riding side by side. And of course, many people who are sort of critical of car culture, people like myself like to point out, you know, in, a, in an automobile, often there's no one sitting in the passenger seat and it's, it's the space for two people sitting side by side, just in case two, like, you know, it's, it's often wasted space. Drivers always get to be in cars with someone at their side. And even if they don't, they keep that space reserved because that's how big the car is anyways, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's a kind of critique and conversation. But what is often absent in that and what, what, lead, what leaves us with a shallow analysis is if we don't kind of come to terms with like how that came to be. And as you just so nicely explained, to, to try to understand how that came to be absent an analysis of race, for example, as well as class, um, and of course, gender, who's, you know, uh, traditionally in sort of considered to be the motorist would be more men, especially decades ago. Um, we need to think of all of these things together in order to understand this issue about the public space on the question of cyclists riding side by side in the relationship with motorists therein. So I'm so glad you shared that story because for me, that's a really nice way of, of, of thinking um, of those connections. Let me ask you a question though related to what you were just saying about the kind of the aftermath of stealing or of course in South Africa the aftermath of apartheid which involved so many kinds of theft in so many different ways um, of land of labor um, I mean an attempted theft of dignity we can think of apartheid in so many ways obviously mm -hmm. but what about this um, we could think about it as an aftermath but what about a way of even thinking about like a kind of an even stronger continuity. So what I mean here is, you know, in 1994, obviously there was 
you know, it was such a momentous, um, the end of apartheid, um, you know, an election in which everyone could participate. And of course, that uh, joy and euphoria, you know, in South Africa and in many places around the world, uh, among progressive forces about the end, finally, of this system, the official end, of course, has led to, um, you would probably have better words for it than me, but for lack of a better term, maybe disappointment at the ways that South African society hasn't transformed in as egalitarian a way as it might have, right? If you think about, if you were to think about people in 1994, they might have had a vision, say for 2021, if you were to ask them to look in the future from that point, that might have, that might have turned out better than it has, right? Um, in terms of some of the continuities of the ways that, um, that that structures of inequality have have continued, and maybe there's even a way. Now, now I'm I'm stepping quite out of my expertise here, so help me. There's a way that we might want to think about the the white power structure of apartheid as having sort of continued itself in a position of dominance through privatization, um, through not and not just automobility here, but through a way of um, of through neoliberalism, um, which obviously involves people of color as well, some, but at the same time maintains a kind of still recognizable structure of, of racial and class inequality in the country. Um, so is there a way of thinking about um, automobility connected to sort of something more than just an aftermath, but kind of continuities of those structures that apartheid represents? Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I think it does. <laughs> uh, I'm not a po 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 political economist, <laughs> um, but uh, I think I mean there's a lot of scholarly work into this. Um, you know that you know that shows us that in terms of your phrase of continuity, um, you know, capitalism has continued to be the way in which you know South African society is organized and structured. Um, and in that way, so that those logics uh, persist to this to this day, um, and for sure, I mean, there have been changes in you know, as you say, in you know, if we focus on the kind of class dimension, you know, so there's um, you know, people of color are increasingly in uh, positions of management in corporations and ownership, um, you know, um, but also. Uh, but I think fundamentally, I mean, uh, the kind of structures of inequality, you know, haven't uh, really ruptured in some way, in many ways. And I'm trying to remember now, I mean, there's very interesting work, you know, done by other colleagues who look at this kind mm -hmm. of economy work and, uh, in, in the long term. And in, in actually suggesting that there's kind of deepening and widening uh, inequality. Um, so the question of continuity is, continuity is definitely there, but if we go back, at least for me, to more comfortable grounds, because <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. a political economist, uh, in terms of automobility, uh, again, I mean, I think I would agree with you here. Uh, I think what, just to go back to another little story and to connect to kind of contemporary, let's say, national government policy in terms of continuity, um, Ford, uh, you were talking about Canada, uh, I think, um, yeah, uh, one of the countries, one of the first countries that uh, Ford uh, creates a overseas uh, manufacturing capacity uh, uh, is, is in South Africa. Uh, I think in the 1920s, 1930s, I need to go and double check my dates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, in a town that has now changed its name, um, and when Ford comes here at that time, uh, you know, they enter into a really nice uh, agreement with the national government uh, where, you know, they receive a whole range of concessions and one of, um, in terms of tax and so on, uh, yeah. uh, tax contributions from the national government uh, with the explicit uh, quid pro quo that they will have to prioritize hiring white workers uh, to work in the manufacturing of motor vehicles. Um, so from very early days, um, you know, uh, you know, the uh, Ford as, you know, as a you know, corporation is able to support um, sort of the colonial uh, uh, regime. Um, and, and I guess what I'm trying to say, yeah. Uh, so this kind of 
there's almost um, we can say maybe that is the, kind of the earliest instance in which um, the motor vehicle industry in South Africa uh, develops a very close relationship with the government. And up to mm -hmm. today, uh, the uh, national gov government continues to see the motor uh, vehicle manufacturing industry as key for job creation, employment, and so on, and continue to, to receive a, you know, a wide range of uh, incentives in order to, to ensure that you know, motor vehicles are manufactured here you know, for local sales, but also for export. Um, so in that way, yeah, I see continuity <laughs> uh, in the way in which you know, capitalism has embedded itself even through the motor vehicle industry as one particular niche sector. Yeah, that's so interesting. And that's, of course, you know, such an important thing when we're talking about autom automobility, obviously, is the production, you know. Um, uh, Elizabeth Ash in, uh, in the color line and the assembly line has written about this with Ford and it's transnational, including South Africa, Brazil, other places, um, their transnational reach. And, um, and in her story, she's more focused on, on exactly that race class production kind of story. Um, but, but what you're doing here is also connecting that to obviously a kind of consumption and use story of the car once it's made and where it goes and what space it takes up and so on. Also in your in your remarks, you reminded me uh, a little bit of this kind of in Canada. I, I'll, I'll I'll put it more there, which is which I've, I've thought about a little bit more. Uh, and and other scholars, Glenn Colthard and others, have have said quite a bit about this. But when we're thinking just about this idea of public space, in particularly in a settler colonial context, um, so I'm thinking particularly of Canada here. Uh, but it'd be interesting to think about this in in a South African context too. You know, public space is itself already a kind of problematic proposition in some ways. Public space, that's space for everybody and so on. But in Canada, if settlers are talking about public space, it's actually on indigenous territory. So again, a theft upon a theft. If if the property has been, if the land has been stolen, and now the people who stole that land are talking in progressive sounding ways about the commons and public space, well, wait a minute, what about that theft in the first place? And instead of a move that says reclaiming the commons for settlers, how about land back to indigenous people? Um, so, so even that issue of public space is, uh, is you know, in different ways, a kind of complicated uh, thing to think about. And when we're thinking about automobility and thinking about critiques of automobility, and thinking then about how if we critique automobility, we can maybe translate that into practice by redistributing public space for everyone, not just people who have cars and access to them. Um, there's more to think about in a colonial context because there's the question of whose land is the, prop is, is the public space to begin with. Um, so I don't know if that, if that resonates in a South African context, obviously because the history of settler colonialism there is, is quite different. Um, in terms of the, the demographic balance, obviously in Canada, indigenous peoples um, comprise a smaller percent vis-a-vis -vis settlers uh, uh, than is the case in South Africa. But, um, but are there discussions in South Africa about public space, or I should say, are there also conversations in South Africa about kind of whose land is this in the first place? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the <laughs> that debate continues. Uh, the land distribution debate mm -hmm. uh, is is very alive, and it's it's kind of a debate that I'm personally weary, uh, not weary, but um, as you can imagine, it's it's quite a sensitive debate. Uh, I see, um, and it's taken all kinds of directions. Uh, you know, so on the one hand, there are those who are deeply disappointed by the efforts that the you know liberation, liberation political party has taken uh, whether it's uh, rural land or urban land um, but let's just say uh, so that i don't waffle for too long yeah no <laughs> it's interesting i think <laughs> i think the interesting direction that it's uh, has been going was that i think for a long time the focus was on if you're going to think about whose land it, it is that discussion seemed to be focused very much on uh, redistrib re redistribution of farm farmland, right? Uh, and increasingly, people are beginning to say, "Hey, hang on, let's uh, let's look at what's happening in urban spaces. Yeah. Um, to what extent, 
um, can we talk about theft happening there? And some people are suggesting, can we look at uh, even property that is owned by the state uh, currently and so on? Um, so yeah, that, that debate is happening uh, and I'll be very closely monitoring to see to what extent, if any, it would intersect with our discussion on and streets and public and public spaces. Yeah, wow, that's so fascinating. So to say one more thing about Vancouver in my hometown right now, um, the Squamish Nation, one of the of the local uh, indigenous communities there. Um, so part of you know obviously much of their land was taken from them. Um, the community was was placed on a reserve and so on and. Um, but one, one section of, of the city that's very close to the city center, they were able to get, to get jurisdiction of again. And what this has meant is they're now, they're now, they've just done the proposal for it and it's going through, they're now building um, a, a massive, um, really uh, dense urban um, community uh, that's going to have considerable affording houses and it connects directly to the automobility question, but because, they have sovereignty over this, this parcel of land. They don't have to abide by the city ordinance around parking minimums. So they're gonna have much, much less space for cars or parking in this space. Whereas if that had been a development under the jurisdiction of the city of Vancouver, there's laws in place, they have to have a certain number of parking and so on. And so they're gonna drastically reduce this. So this is going to be a kind of reclamation of indigenous sovereignty in an urban space that's going to involve more dense and affordable housing and less space for cars. It kind of brings all the, all the issues uh, together. So that will be a really interesting development to watch. Um, uh, I'll send you a little bit more information about that. Uh, yeah, please this. do. But, uh, but there, there's definitely places where exactly this conversation, um, you know, which, which sometimes in the Canadian context too, is, is sometimes thought about as a kind of rural situation, but it but it's very much, um, as you're saying, an urban one too. So there's another another example. Um, okay, um, I've taken up quite a bit of time. Let me ask you one more kind of big question. You can answer it brief, briefly or or you can you can take it where you will. So thinking at the transnational scale, um, and again, with the with the climate emergency, you know, um, encouraging us so much to do, of course, to think beyond national borders. Um, what lessons do you think the international community could draw from South Africa's experience of automobility? <laughs> Again, another, another very big question. Yeah, sorry, uh, that's my tendency. I pose, a, I pose a big question and then just let you do, do what you will with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I think, I think, yeah, a couple of things. I mean, the one, uh, word that comes to mind is organize, 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 power, mm -hmm. power, power, <laughs> or maybe that's a second word. Um, because when I think about, at least in my examination of how automobility sort of embedded itself in Johannesburg and in South Africa more broadly, I think, uh, and I, I suppose your question is really about thinking about how, you know, uh, people seeking to do something about the climate emergency might mobilize themselves, um, you know, uh, to do something about the crisis that we're all facing um, is, I suppose from that perspective, I mean, um, the nowadays automobility seems almost um, uh, in extra, in extra, what was the word I'm looking for? Uh, so much part and parcel of, of, of Johannesburg, so much part of South Africa. Um, but actually, when we look back, uh, it, it, and I think it's a story, it's a global story. Um, it really was not obvious that uh, automobility would gain, you know, the kind of power that it does currently, uh, that it would, um, at least in a, in a Johannesburg context, um, Automobility is, you know, is taken so much for granted that it's that if you want to go from A to B, that's uh, that's how we do it. Um, but without talking too long, I mean, it just uh, it's clear that it really took a lot of organized uh, effort from a variety of actors uh, to really persuade the authorities to uh, persuade uh, the public uh, that. Uh, 
that you know automobility was the way to go. You know, you know one of the earliest uh, controversies really was around the question of road safety. Um, like here, like many many other places, you know, there were newspapers with columns like uh, entitled "The Motor Peril." You know, so there was really a lot of anxiety and concern about um, the kind of road carnage that cars were beginning to unleash. And there was a, a range of other kind of skepticism around automobility in the 1920s and 1910s. Um, and to some extent, you you might say that there's still some. Uh, similarly, if we turn around to the climate change question, if we think about alternative uh, power, uh, we might say there's still, you know, some uh, worries or anxiety or people are not so persuaded about solar, <laughs> for instance, or wind. Um, there are all kinds of uh, questions. Um, in South Africa, I mean, I think the question here, since the electricity grid is powered mainly by coal, um, you know, one of the questions that is going on is, can solar, can wind, uh, provide, uh, I think the technical term they use, the base load electricity in the same way that coal can provide. Um, and then, you know, and I think jumping back to the automobility question, the associations, uh, the collective associations that emerged, uh, I think in, in 1922, the, the National Automobile Association, it's specific in purpose, uh, as I can see in the historical record, was really to wage a propaganda war. <laughs> That's the terminology that they used. Uh, we are coming together so that we can find, fight this public relations um, uh, problem that we have. Uh, so I think, inversely, um, I think that climate change uh, activists you know, could learn uh, from that. Um, obviously, colleagues know this already, but I think for me, this is the kind of lesson that I that I take. Unfortunately, I think um, we are in a time of emergency, so I think we need solutions quicker than uh, very quickly. Yeah, we need to uh, shift in the other direction. But it it really took uh, a long time for the automobility lobby to establish itself. But I don't know if we have a similar kind of time really uh, to avert serious climate crisis. Exactly. Um, well, that seems like a really important place to, to leave this with the, with the urgency, you know, um, and exactly, thank you for that answer, um, that the, that, you know, it, it's, it's not just interesting for people outside of South Africa to know a little bit about the South African story, but in some ways imperative exactly for the reasons that you talk about, about organizing, about power, and about what's at stake transnationally around the ways that, that car culture connects to, um, to all of these, all of these issues. Um, so, uh, Jogu, I just want to say thank you so much. It's you've been really patient with my sweeping questions, um, and it's just been uh, a real delight to be in conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've also learned a lot about what's happening elsewhere in Canada, in particular. So, do send me those links. I'd love to learn, learn more about what that group is proposing. About I certainly will. I certainly will. Okay, I'll stop the recording here.